Jesse is signing off for the very last time. The station was later closed and bulldozed into rubble, but its legacy remains a red-hot slice of panhandle folklore. No one in Amarillo will ever forget the ghastly tale of Debbie, David, and their final ride through town. And strange felony files returns a missing minister and a dismembered body leave the residents of Nashville in fear. I thought we might be dealing with some sadistic homicide. And later, a funeral parlor romance takes a chilling turn. More than 700 churches inside city limits, the people of Nashville consider themselves God-fearing folk. But all the prayer in the world couldn't keep hellfire and brimstone from raining down on the Emanuel Church of Oneness on one unforgettable night. When firefighters finally put out the fire, a grisly discovery is made. Not far from the altar lay the charred remains of a headless, one-armed body with the flesh cut away from both shoulders. It looked like the victim had been filleted before being barbecued. Clothing found on the body seems to confirm the worst. It's the beloved pastor of the Emmanuel Church of Oneness, David Terry. What I was seeing was so bizarre. They were telling me this is not a typical homicide. I mean, there's something strange here, very strange. Was it a ritual killing by a satanic cult? Had the devil come to Nashville? Or was there something even more bizarre behind the murder of the minister? Pentecostal minister David Terry had been leading a manual church of oneness for more than a decade. David's father was a minister. David he was raised in this church, and he would have been a disappointment to his family had he not been a minister. Terry seemed to love his job and his congregants. Every Sunday, they thumped their Bibles and praised Jesus to the rafters. Pentecostal is our type of worship. We are somewhat emotional, lively. We lift our hands. We worship God out loud. So who would want to torch the church and carve up the preacher? Pastor Terry's flock did have one black sheep, an unemployed ne'er-do-well named James Matheny. James Matheny was married to one of the faithful church members, Teresa Matheny. My husband would give you the shirt off his back, you know, if you needed it. He had his demons too. He had a problem with alcohol. The Matheny's turned to the pastor for guidance, and Terry bent over backwards to help. Not only did he give Matheny a job as a church handyman, he became his surrogate big brother. Oh, man, Jim looked up to him. He was so excited that David was helping him and giving him this attention, that he had given him a job in the church to, to help him really get on his feet. Terry and Matheny both enjoy the outdoors and discover that fishing together kept Matheny away from the bottle and gave Pastor Terry more time to counsel him. Everybody commended David Terry on how he was taking interest in rebuilding this man's life. The pastor was just a real sort of the earth guy, or so it seemed. On a mere 25 grand a year, he supported a wife and four children, and he still managed to open his wallet for parishioners. Most of his congregation were poor, and he would help them get jobs, and he would help them with money if he had money. David was probably the most loved and honored minister that had ever walked through our doors, but uh, he was not the man that they really thought he was. You see, Terry may have preached on the virtues of spiritual wealth, but what he secretly yearned for were worldly goods, fancier clothes, a better car, and a bigger house. This was a man that was trapped in one lifestyle and wanted another. 
but the good life appeared to be within reach. You see, Terry was being groomed for the position of assistant bishop overseer. It was the number two job in the parish, and paid $75,000 a year. Greed soon consumed David Terry, the impatient pastor embezzled $50,000 that had come from a sale of church property. He took the money and deposited it initially into the church's general account and then moved it over to his personal private account. With his wallet now stuffed, Terry started living high on the hog. He even bought himself a motorcycle. He was expecting to, to put this money back once he came into the position of the assistant overseer without anybody ever knowing that it had been taken. Waiting for his promotion, Terry grew nervous, edgy, and disagreeable. Not exactly the qualities they looked for in church leadership. The bishop overseer just didn't feel right about his successor, John David Terry. Something was wrong, he said, and so he decided not to step down. For David, the bishop overseer of this church was his way out, and he saw that door shut on him. Suddenly, Terry had no promotion, no raise, and no way to pay back the stolen money. All he had to look forward to now was a road of shame leading straight to a five by eight foot cell. He felt like that he was locked into a situation that he could not get out of. He felt trapped and he was looking for a way out and took an irrational course. The once pious preacher began devouring do-it-yourself crime books. He paid special attention to the chapters on changing your identity. He remembered a former childhood classmate of his who had died in a fishing accident when he was five or six years old. The drowned boy's name was Jerry Milan. One quick trip to public records gave Terry all the information he needed to get a birth certificate in Milam's name. He was able to go to the Social Security Administration and apply for a Social Security number. And once he had that, you know, he was able then to apply for a driver's license. He was going to make it appear as if he, David Terry, had been murdered. Police don't go looking for dead men. Terry saw only one way out. All he needed was someone to play the role of a dead pastor. He was selected, obviously, just based on his body size, his age, his weight, everything about him. Terry was setting a deadly trap, one he knew his disciple James Matheny would walk right into. Some describe James Matheny as following Terry like a puppy dog. I think in the end it was like a lamb to the slaughter. When we come back, Pastor Terry's plan takes a savage turn. Terry and treated this body no different from you and I would if we were to lay on a stake. <laughs> Pastor David Terry had fleeced his flock of 50 grand. Unable to return the money, it was just a matter of time until he was exposed. I think that put David in panic. And to cover this theft up, he had to kill himself or appear to be dead so people wouldn't look for him. The unwitting accomplice was Terry's most devoted parishioner, James Matheny. Jim called David Terry every day. You know, what do you need me to do today? You know, he just loved him so much and trusted him and believed in him. Terry asked Matheny to go fishing. They met after hours in the church. They stored their tackle. When David Terry asked him to move some articles, he did not hesitate. He turned his back on David Terry one too many times. Matheny's spirit may have gone to heaven, but his body was about to go through hell. David Terry had been a butcher in a meat market. And David Terry treated this body no different than you and I would if we were filleting a steak. So the full-time pastor and part-time butcher now put his meat-cutting skills to work, severing anything that could identify the body. He removed the head and right arm. He filleted 
both of his upper arms that contained tattoos on them. He took those off and flushed them down the toilet. The pastor bagged up Mathedes, headed off, and dressed the corpse in his own clothes. He placed his wingtip shoes on the body and put his own belt and the initial T on it around the victim's waist. Next, he planted evidence to make it look like James Matheny had killed him for his money. He put items in James Matheny's apartment that belonged to David Terry, his billfold and some of his ID. Then Terry took one more gruesome step to mislead the police. He took the right hand that had been removed from the body and imprinted the victim's fingerprints on a beer bottle that was in the preacher's car. Everybody would have known the preacher would not have had a beer bottle. Next, he sunk the severed head and arm in a lake. Then Terry returned to his church of oneness. He lit it up like a backyard grill and split top. Uh, David Terry went to Memphis. He obviously had been planning it for a while. Back in Nashville, firefighters seemed to have the Lord on their side. If it had burned another six minutes, they would have been out of control and the body would have been totally destroyed. By some miracle, the blast from a water cannon landed directly on the body, preserving it even more. Now we've got a partially pressed body with the heads missing, the right arms missing, these filleted uh, areas around the shoulders, uh, the, the skin missing. Uh, there's something really strange here that I thought we might be dealing with some sadistic homicide of sorts. Pastor Terry's wingtip survived the fire, so did his trademark belt. His plan was working to a T. <sighs> Neighbors and parishioners were in shock over the loss of both church and pastor, and the police were suddenly very interested in the whereabouts of one James Matheny. We've got the, some ID from David Terry found in James Matheny's home. We've got James Matheny's fingerprints on a beer bottle in the Reverend's car. So there would be many reasons why one would suspect hey, James Matheny has murdered David Terry. Sorry, Detective. Pastor Terry tricked you and the city of Nashville into thinking he was dead. They said Jim had killed the preacher. You know, he's killed David, he's burnt the church, he's gone. Not a standing there and I thought, no, he didn't. He loved him way too much. A lot of things Jim was, he wasn't a murderer. For the next 48 hours, Nashville was in mourning for the poor dead preacher. Then the medical examiner compared some of Terry's old x-rays to the headless body. At that point, Dr. Harlan told me, this is not David Terry, this is James Matheny. His uh, plan had gone awry, and the police figured out that it was not the preacher who was killed in the church belfry, but rather the church handyman. And they were looking for John David Terry. To think for one moment that, that he was capable of doing anything like this was beyond imagination. While in hiding, Terry completely transformed himself. If anyone ever came looking for him, David Terry wouldn't be recognizable. His appearance had changed so dramatically that it was clear that he was starting a new life, that here was a man who had left everybody. But Terry couldn't escape his own conscience. The minister he used to be was haunting the killer he'd become. Within two days after killing James Matheny, he threw the murder weapon in the Mississippi River, turned around, drove 180 miles back to Nashville, and turned himself in. That was the end of the road for David Terry. After being convicted of Matheny's murder, the pastor earned himself a date with the electric chair. For once, he didn't have a prayer. You know, one day before, 